What's your name? Victor. So thank you for asking. Few people ask that. The correct pronunciation of my name is Adia. Yes. Yeah. Hi, everyone. You guys don't look happy to be here. I know it's Saturday and Tech Point forced you to come out. But you are planning on having fun, yes? Oh, wow. Victor, you didn't ginger this crowd for me now. What kind of hype man are you? Hi. All right, so I'll try to keep this short. I, uh, first of all, let me thank uh, Tech Point for inviting me to make this keynote. And I just want to have a quick chat about Africa as the next frontier for technology. I think it's less of a function of if we will become the next frontier. I think our population alone means that we are younger and greater in number um, than any other continent in the world. So we'll be a frontier for something. The goal is hopefully it's something good. And so I want to spend today talking about the conditions that will help us um, achieve the goal of becoming that frontier more successfully, right? So what's the state of the world now? Um, there are countries that are de described as developed. Countries in Africa are often described as developing or emerging or frontier markets. So on most indices in the world, we are behind, except population, like I mentioned before. But as the youngest continent in the world, the great thing about that is, like most young people, you don't have to care about the things that happen to more developed or older continents. Right? And technology is what helps us rewrite that script. But there are a few things that I want to leave with you to think about, some seeds that I want to plant, right? Um, and they're going to be important because I reckon you guys are the ones that are going to be building the products and services that make Africa the next frontier of the world, okay? So here are the three things. One, the philosophies that guide the products we build and why we build them. Two, breaking down what our context really, really means, right? You hear people say things like localization, localization, localization. What does that really means, mean in terms of what you need to consider as you build um, products? And three, product adoption, right? Um, sorry, I didn't bring any slides, so you have to just enjoy my face and voice today. Um, okay, so first, I want to talk about philosophies, right? So um, we often... We now have an opportunity through connectivity to tap into global perspectives on a variety of subjects. What then happens is that we then borrow mentalities that don't really work for us and try to copy and paste them into this market. And then that leads to problems. You find certain companies trying to constantly build and keep rebuilding and rebuilding themselves, right? You see the same company trying to do the same thing over and over again, and you wonder why. I think sometimes it's because we've borrowed the philosophy that doesn't quite fit us. My favorite example for this right now is the discussion around data privacy, right? So the narrative abroad right now is data should be private, citizens should own their data, citizens should permit every single kilobyte of their data um, being released manually and specifically, and even earn money from it. I think that's fine in a society where you can afford to live a life offline and you have access to the same services um, that you would online, that you do offline. But in places like Africa or even Nigeria, where there are certain services that just wouldn't exist if they weren't digitized, having a narrative that is that specific is a bit dangerous for us. It's the difference between, for instance, in Nigeria, providing credits to people or not. Data is the oil that is going to feed the digital economy. And if we don't allow data to flow through it, because we are importing a context from another continent. We won't progress. So we need to be very, very careful as we adopt philosophies that were not crafted within this context, right? The next thing I want to talk about um, would be the three big things I think about when building products, right? So this would be that we are in a low data environment, we are in a low trust environment, and we are in a low infrastructure environment. And I'll give examples as to what, what this actually means in practice. So in a low data environment, the implication is that we have not chosen a single basis upon which to make decisions. Our decisions are not data driven, which means, you know, John, James, and Jimo are coming into a room and choosing their own basis for making a decision. So when we are in a low data environment and we are all choosing different bases for making decisions, we cannot make data-driven decisions, right? So 
let's think about how countries were formed before, right? You usually had a guiding philosophy that was usually created post-bloodshed. There was usually a war, civil war, or even genocide, right? You can't do those types of things anymore. So how? How do you unify a bunch of people around a philosophy, around a company vision, around a mission, right? The only thing that successfully does that these days is data. This even affects me on a day-to-day -day basis as a leader of a multi-generational team, right? It's, it's tougher for me to make arguments these days based on my experience, right? Because everyone can go on the internet and form an opinion and get support from that opinion, uh, support for that opinion, even from people thousands of miles away, right? Just because of that connectivity. So these days I find that data has become even more important. But in this environment, the data isn't just sitting there. So one thing I think about when creating products is you have to make a product that creates data to support not only your decision making, but potentially the decision making of people outside of your environment. Right? So it's important to think about what is measurable and making sure you measure it and keeping it for a day when you need to make a decision. Right? So the second thing I think about is low trust. Um, Low trust is such a fundamental challenge, right? When you walk into a room and you're trying to make an agreement with somebody, there are certain things that you need to be given confidence by, and trust is one of them. But in, in a country or in an area where there's no identity, there's no um, enforceability of law, there's no strong uh, policing, it's very difficult. If someone doesn't fulfill an agreement that you make with them, there's very little recourse that you have, right? But strangely enough, there's actually an equation for trust. And it actually com it's composed of elements that you can look up and actually work on as you build a product. So let me give you an example of, of products that frighten people because they ask for too much upfront without delivering on their end of the trust equation. Right? Imagine you see an app and it's asking you for all your personal information, your BVN, your NIN. You're not even sure what this app does. Right? BVN is available via API. You don't actually have to ask somebody for their BVN, right? Because when you ask someone for their BVN, you are putting them in a difficult position. They first of all have to go and find it. I haven't memorized my BVN. So you're already introducing multiple steps into the process. And then you're asking them for a piece of information where there are many people and institutions telling them not to share it, even though that is not perfectly accurate advice. So you're triggering a fear response just in the way you have designed the front screen of your product. So you are asking a question that doesn't necessarily even need to be asked. And, and you're, you're, you're instilling fear in someone and therefore making it difficult for the person to trust you, right? So, so we have to recognize that we are in a low trust environment and think about how to infuse trust in the way we build our products. So I've already talked a little bit about infrastructure, but the importance of infrastructure, like I said, think of it as providing the processes and procedures that define a country. It defines how people behave. And this is often, this infrastructure is often missing in Africa. So the future that we have is one of digital infrastructure. So every product that is being built now has the potential to contribute and become part of that infrastructure. So the first person in lending has the opportunity to create the platform that all other lenders can use. The first person that figures out low-cost healthcare has the opportunity to create a platform that all other doctors can use, low-cost uh, drug delivery, and so on and so forth. So it becomes extremely important for us to start recognizing the fact that when we build products that we have structured trust into, we have made measurable and there's data, it increases the opportunity for them to become infrastructure and for us to consolidate the market by converting our products into platforms and recognizing the opportunity to turn those platforms into the digital infrastructure that we need to operate. And then the last thing I want to talk about is how we think about product adoption. And I'll give some examples here. So I'll give an example of, this, of something that's gone well and something that's gone not so well. Right? So I find that many people just bring fully baked products that they've copied from another market into Africa or into Nigeria, right, and expect them to work. E-commerce is an example. We're still debating whether e-commerce is successful 15 years later. Let's first remember that this debate is not entirely settled even in the country where, even in the countries where e-commerce was invented, right? 15 or 17 years ago, Amazon started and started with selling only books. I was there. 
happened to be doing my master's at the time, right? And I was a heavy user of Amazon because I just started a course and I had a heavy requirement to buy and own books. And then Amazon eventually evolved into the behemoth that it is today. But how did e-commerce arrive in Africa? It arrived with a fully populated store, uh, marketplaces. Um, you have Conga itself as a retailer behind, other traders behind, right? In a market where logistics are already questionable, we didn't even have a working postal system, much less, of, much less one that could support um, commercial needs. So we brought this fully baked product, shoved it into Africa. I mean, hindsight is 2020, but can you see how we set ourselves up differently? Where when Amazon started, even in America, with all that infrastructure present, right? It's, it started with one product, right? With a lot of very comfortable infrastructure um, uh, surrounding it. So we have to think about that carefully. Uber, on the other hand, took a very simple product, but the value proposition, I guess, changed when it got to Africa. So Uber sold, you know, ride hailing as convenience in the States. So you didn't have to have cash in your pocket. You didn't have to worry about tracking the driver if you lost something. You, you, you worried less about your personal safety. In Nigeria, what, what problem did Uber solve? Just simply hailing a cab from wherever you are. You didn't have to go to a main road anymore. Right? And it also made transportation, comfortable transportation, accessible to people who couldn't afford cars at the time. So I think product adoption, and please Google product adoption curve and do this research for yourself. It's a really, really important consideration to think about as you are creating products, right? Because it is okay to actually find your earliest users, your people that are going to be like the iPhone users that used to sleep outside the stores uh, right before the iPhone launch. It's okay to start with those guys because they become the evangelists for your products rather than, rather than trying to eat the whole elephant at once and approach the whole market at once. So let me recap for the sake of, um, you know, uh, our rough start and the introductions here, right? I need you to think about three things as we work together to make Africa the tech frontier of the world, okay? You need to think about the guiding philosophies around technology, right, that are guiding our ecosystem. Two, you need to think about our context, uh, our local context in terms of low data, low infrastructure, and low trust, right? And the third thing I want you to think about is product adoption and actually studying and understanding that curve to allow your innovative products to diffuse properly. So I truly do believe that Africa is the next frontier for technology in many different ways. I believe that the products that we make here will be useful in the world, and I've already seen it happen. I used to work at a company called Migo, and after we launched Migo, what we understood was that in as much as we are serving the local audience here who have been locked out of certain types of financial systems, people who hadn't been able to lend money were able to lend with Migo. We were surprised when we started getting calls into our call center from consumers in the US, in the UK, also wanting credit. We realized that our products also spoke to people that were locked out of the development of the economies, even in developed countries. So for me, us being a frontier can only happen if we think about these principles I've just shared and make sure that our products scale, make the necessary impression that they need to on the rest of the world, and then the world will come calling to ask us for these products. Thank you so much.